Hey fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. For this video, I want to thank Michael for contributing a bunch of videos that I then kind of glued together, edited a bit, and you have in its full glory the Federer frames from 2004 and 2010, if I'm not mistaken about the BLX. That's off the top of my head. I kind of got back into tennis uh, part because of the Federer hype and because it's so enjoyable to watch him play. And I think a lot of players wanted to groom their game and wanted to own his stuff. And luckily for Michael, he has these autographed frames, one match used and one not. So you will see in this video what is different from a Federer Pro Staff 90 and the retail version they were selling. And they changed a little bit over the years. We're starting with the 2004 Encode edition, which uh, is perhaps the best cosmetic of all time or one of my favorites at least because I like the 6195 encode as you know I use that a lot I also liked this one the, the K factor I don't have a grip on for some reason but this was also a very nice racket but Michael actually goes into detail what's different and also how the Asian version actually differed from the retail version sold in the US and Europe some interesting racket knowledge I hope you re appreciate this type of video if you want to contribute something from your racket collection or your knowledge, please get in touch through the comments or uh, the contact us form on tennisner.net. So I really appreciate this being more of a community where we share uh, racket knowledge and talk about tennis in general. Do you think Federer played better with the Pro Staff 90? That was his glory days. Obviously he was younger and faster and stuff like that. Or do you think he elevated his game a gear up when he switched to the pro staff RF97. It's an interesting question. You can be debate that. I think it was sensible to make the switch. And uh, I think the game was just changing. And with guys like Rafa hitting with that the massive spin, he needed something to give him a bit more real estate in the racket head to be able to contact the ball. And he got a bit more power from free. And you see players want to get more power over and over, but sometimes they just go back, like in Mario's case, or they stay with the, the, the frame they, they went for. And sometimes the, the change in, is very, very small, like in Novak's case. I just made a video about Novak's frame, and I will make a video about Mario's frame as well. Uh, so please subscribe to the channel. So sometimes the, the difference is very small. Sometimes they make a more drastic change, like in Federer's case. And now we have Alexei Popperin on the tour making a pretty big adjustment from head to, to Dunlop. We'll see if it lasts. Uh, you never know with the pros. Obviously, they want something that feeds 100% at home, but sometimes they also want more power. But this video is not about that. It's about Federer's frames and what differed from his pro stock Wilson Pro Staff 90 and the retail version. I've talked to some people who know Roger a bit and who's been around with him on the tour and so on. And, and from what I heard, he wasn't as picky as some players are about their rackets. He, he could play with, with the variants. If you want to support the channel and the work I do, please use the links in the description. I also want to give a shout out to Fuzzy Yellow Balls. They sponsor some videos. They have this great app in, in the App Store where you can download Crush It and you can use it to really develop your game and use more of the kinetic chain. And as you can see in this example, it's, it's a great tool to do that. And I can only say good things about the products of Faciela Balls. I only really recommend stuff that I use myself. My job is to be completely honest. Sometimes it backfires for me personally, but uh, that's what I can promise you. Word over to Michael. All right, hi there. What we have here are three variations of the ENCODE 90 racket, which Federer um, basically made famous, if we want to a better term, back in 2004 <clears throat> when he won the US Open, which is where this particular frame comes from. So I obtained this very luckily via eBay back in 2004, I believe, from a stringer that was in the US Open. And he sold a match frame and then he basically asked if I would like this particular frame because I missed out on the match frame. And I obviously said yes. And the main differences here, and I'll compare that to the retail version, is that there are four basically string holes on the PWS system versus the five that you will see on the retail version in a second. And the paint job as well, when I go around and you'll kind of see it, appears more matte on this on his particular frame versus the retail, which is a little bit more glossy. 
And the other telltale sign that you'll notice in a second is the shorter palette for his handle. Again, this was not part of the retail version. The retail version was slightly longer. However, in terms of everything else, it is the same as what you would see on the retail version in terms of the information on the inside. Uh, Federer has signed this himself. Um, so obviously I won't be gripping this up or putting in the grommets to actually try out. And you'll also see the other information that came from the program as well it comes across. So that is Federer's personal racket. All right, so the next racket I'd like to show you is the retail version of the ENCODE 90 that was released to the general public. And as you will see here, there are five sort of crosses coming out of the PWS system, as opposed to Federer's personal racket, which had four uh, from the previous video. And as we go around, I think you'll hopefully see that the ENCODE sign is a lot more glossy, a lot more shiny on this particular frame versus Federer's personal racket. And the final sort of telltale sign you'll kind of see down here is the palette being longer when compared to Federer's personal frame. Other than that, um, everything else is pretty much the same, uh, with the exception of the fact that Federer's frame had his signature or a signature printed on the frame itself. Now, the final racket I want to show or share with you is actually a Japanese version that was released back, I think, in 2005. And these were part of like a special uh, limited run of Federer's kind of racket in terms of, and you'll notice in a second, there's drill spacing on the PWS being four, which is identical to his personal frame. And I was able to snag one, possibly two of these, if I can't remember. And this was as close as you were gonna to get to Federer's personal frame, other than actually having his one. And again, hopefully you saw the ENCODE printing is a lot more matte on this one versus the glossy. The only difference between this particular version and Federer's one was the fact that the palette for the handle is the same as the retail, the original retail that I showed. And as you'll see on the side, it's actually got Federer's sort of autograph on there and the mention, I believe, of the 1619 string pattern. But yeah, everything else pretty much as you would kind of expect, I guess. And what I'll do very quickly is place the retail version prior to this Japanese version being released to the public. So I have placed the retail version that originally was released to the public over the special edition racket that was made available in Japan. And hopefully you'll kind of see the slightly different string spacing in terms of the PWS being five on the retail versus the four um, that was released on the Federer Special Edition. And then what I'll quickly do is switch this around and you'll kind of hopefully see the slight difference on the paint in terms of the glossy finish versus the matte. And then if you remember on the Federer version that was released in Japan and on his personal racket, it had his signature on there, and this original retail version didn't. And here we have another, from my personal collection, one of Federer's match-used rackets from... Oh, I'm just trying to remember when the this particular colorway was released to the public. Apologies for me not knowing. Uh, I'm sure you can fill in the blanks very quickly, but you'll kind of see the shorter palette, um, which was signature in terms of Federer's rackets in this iteration before they were kind of made public to myself and obviously anyone else who wished to play with sort of Federer's similar setup. You'll kind of see as well, there's the reverse hybrid 
with the string savers at those particular points. Then we've got the power pads just a little bit there, which Sampras used as well to, I guess, dampen everything else. I do have a retail version of this racket, but it's not strong, so trying to compare the weights and everything else would just probably do an injustice. But what I will do in a second is switch on the scales and then you can kind of see, apologies that it's quite crude in terms of my design, but it weighs 367 grams, which I am guessing is pretty much how he would have it. As you can see, it has been a little bit battered and bruised. And the final racket I'll quickly show you, a Marat Safin racket. It's a very quick video for you to show you the, the shrewd paint job that Head tried to do um, for this particular frame. Uh, again, lucky enough to have this. Safin has signed it. I'm hoping that the signature will stay there for some time. And you'll see on the inside of the throat, uh, Marat Safin's name. I think on this side, you can kind of see the date uh, in which it was originally strung. Kilos on the string tension. But here we go, the good old paint job. So if you remember, the flex point was supposed to have an indentation at that particular point, and had uh, basically tried to paint it on, giving you the 3D effect. In addition, you'll see some lead taping on the inside of the top part of the hoop, just like so. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure if this was Safin's choice of string. Um, this is what it came with, and that's the weight. About 373, 374 grams. 